My name is Michelle Sampson, and I am the library director here at the New York Public Library. I wanted to thank everyone so much for coming out um, for today's event, the first of, we hope, many annual lectures on a variation of the theme of civic engagement and leadership. Before we get started, I would like to ask everyone to please silence their phones if you haven't already done so. Because I want to make sure to give credit where credit is due, today's program was meticulously planned by three people. Our assistant director, Sophie Smith, who is here somewhere. Our marketing and development coordinator, Jane Zabisky Hoffman, and former library trustee, Barbara Chase, one half of the duo whose idea it was to establish the Dan Bancroft Memorial Endowment. The other half, being a current library trustee, Will Etheridge, who was unable to be with us today. I hope you will join me in applauding the extraordinary amount of work they put forth to make this day happen. It goes without saying, today would not have happened without Dan. Sometimes we run the risk of putting someone no longer with us on a pedestal. But in this case, Dan Bancroft was the real deal, capital R, capital D. When he and his wife, Anne, moved here just a handful of years ago, each became involved in the community in a myriad of ways. One of the first things Dan did was to begin writing for our small town newspaper, The York Weekly. A few years later, in the aftermath of COVID, when there were local teacher shortages, Dan stepped up. And really, who among us wouldn't give up a well-deserved retirement to spend days with a middle schooler? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of middle schools, in late 2022, I caught wind that a York resident was challenging It's Perfectly Normal, a book about puberty that was in the middle school library. Knowing that the school librarians might not be in a position to speak, out against this attempted censorship, I sent out a call to our staff and board of trustees to show up to an up upcoming school board meeting. <laughs> and that's how I first met Anne Bancroft, Anne's wife. They answered that call, and that night Anne spoke eloquently about the dangers of censorship. I should note the book was ultimately retained in the school library. And with that, I would like to introduce you to one of the kindest, and strongest women I had the good fortune to meet in Bangkok. It is lovely to see such a full library. What a treat. To begin with, I want to share that our children and I are so very grateful to the staff and the board of the York Public Library and all of those who have contributed to the endowment in Dan's name. What an honor you have bestowed on him and all of us, and we are amazingly grateful. And then I want to tell you that a few months ago, in anticipation of this event, I came to see Michelle, who is always so gracious about making time for me. I had just decided that somehow, as a result of this event, we could eradicate fascist activities in this country in Dan's honor. <laughs> Ian was a first-generation German-Jewish immigrant. His parents arrived at Ellis Island in October of 1947 from Jerusalem. He 
was born in 1950, a fellow boomer like myself, although to be clear, an older one than I am. <laughs> the message his parents gave to him was to assimilate, to be a part of what this country had to offer. And though we were seven and a half years apart in age, we learned early on that we shared a Kennedy era ideal of service to community and country. I'm sure you will remember Kennedy's words, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. <coughs> Dan was a philosophy major in college and then went to law school. He worked for legal services in Pennsylvania before moving to Massachusetts and starting a law partnership. The Dans, as they were known, built a practice largely around housing issues. And my Dan would often remark to me that housing was such a definitional part of our human safety and well-being. The issues that he managed in his practice cut very close to the bone. He could never quite figure out why we as humans divide ourselves the way we do, why we insist on tribalizing and creating boundaries even national boundaries. He wondered if we wouldn't be better off without them. I suspect that's why he loved the idea of the free library, where any and all are welcomed to history and creativity and imagination at no cost. I am also very glad that Dan found his way among you here at the York Public Library because he had so much to give and he was so glad to be a part of it. In many ways, you made room for one of his Kennedy moments. Thank you so much to all of you fellow library people, and today especially thank you to John Paltry for being willing to offer this inaugural address. The topics you cover, from the challenge to local news to the censoring of literature in any way, were very close to Dan's heart. I am also very honored this afternoon to welcome the brilliant Barbara Chase, for whom we are also very grateful, to Barbara and Will and the board of the library for founding this endowment. So I want to encourage Barbara to come forward and tell us a little bit more about Dr. Pottery this afternoon. Thank you. of serving on the board with him uh, and just retired actually in July of this year. He was a really visionary, great leader, and he was an extraordinary human being. There could not be, I don't think, a more ideal person to inaugurate this series on civic leadership and engagement in which, uh, in Dan's memory, than John Palfrey. John Palfrey is the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation President. He, um, in that role, has, um, has done amazing work, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, to summarize. But first of all, um, I would like to say that um, your program summarizes his professional life so I'm not going to go into detail, but I just want to highlight a few things. First of all, John's connection with Harvard is long and deep. He went there as an undergraduate, received his undergraduate degree, and then his law degree. Uh, and then he joined the Harvard Law School faculty as professor. Um, thought, researched, wrote um, on many topics. His specialty was um, intellectual property law and internet law. Um, he's had many achievements at Harvard during his time at the law school. Just to mention a few, he was a founding president of the board of the National Digital Public Library, which is an amazing resource for, sort of like for scholars and for the general public. The National Digital Public Library, 
I encourage you to look it up. Uh, he also wrote a book called Born Digital, Understanding the First Generation of Digital Natives, uh, which is a book that has had profound impact on people understanding the impact of the digital age on young people growing up. Um, I'm going to skip the next part of this um, professional life for just one minute and go to 2019 when John became the president of the MacArthur Foundation. In that relatively short time, he has done amazing things to lead the organization in creating a more a more just I only want to do a burden free for a just. That's not good. Just burden and peace for the world. Um, just two examples of that, recent examples, both of them touching on, on Maine and both of them very congruent with um, Dan's passions, Dan Franco's passions. Two examples. One, um, I, the Foundation has something called 100 and Change, which means that they give $100 billion to an organization to radically change and improve on a problem in our society. Uh, in 2021, they awarded such a grant to Community Solutions, which is an organization based in New York, but a national organization which addresses homelessness and affordable housing. And this organization, the next year, um, became involved in Maine and has had a great impact in Maine on this very um, substantial problem. And no one, as John has said, should be homeless in America. We should eradicate this problem. So the second example is much more recent. Uh, in the June essay that the president of Mark Arthur writes, uh, annual essay, John wrote, at MacArthur, we seek to engage in a national effort to expand local journalism at an unprecedented scale. Just a teaser, because several months later, as in last week, uh, the press release went out for something called um, uh, Press Word, which involves a, a lot of, uh, a number of large foundations, uh, led, I'm pretty sure, by MacArthur. And this uh, group of foundations have, has funded $500 million to help to preserve and, uh, local news. And you'll hear John talk more about that. Anyway, um, this chapter I missed was that um, John was the 15th head of school at Phillips Academy. Uh, it, it, brilliant in their role. It happens that I was a 14. <laughs> <laughs> so I was there for 18 years. My husband and I lived on campus. And when you get ready to retire from a place and you've been there that long, you have real anxiety about <laughs> what's coming next. Well, I have to say that the first time I met John and, and interviewed him, I knew that he was a perfect person for this role. It felt totally right. Uh, and David and I left the head's house to know that John and Catherine and Emmeline and Jack were moving in. And my, when I handed the gavel to John at his installation, that felt totally right. Totally right. It was a generational shift uh, from a person who bought her first cell phone in the year that she came to Andover in 1994 to the author of Digital Native, <laughs> or Digital. Um, but um, we had a lot in common. I knew John had the talent and the, com uh, the commitment and the energy to be a great leader at Andover, and he was. Um, and I was comforted by the fact that John and I shared a deep and abiding and fierce belief that schools like Andover should gather a talented, diverse, inclusive group of students and prepare them to lead lives as adults, lives of uh, meaning and purpose, and in the words of the 18th century constitution of Andover, usefulness to mankind. I give you John Paul. for this kind introduction and invitation and to the incredible, incredible
incredible team that has put today together. I'm really enormously grateful, and uh, I, I couldn't be more honored to be the first uh, speaker on behalf of Dan Bancroft and to the family. Thank you for coming out today. It is very touching to be able to be with you and to dedicate this, of course, uh, to an amazing memory. Uh, and to each of you who has come out on a beautiful day on the coast of Maine to sit inside <laughs> on a Saturday yes, <laughs> at 4 p.m., um, thank you. Thank you for uh, what it means that you are here, which, of course, uh, is no doubt loyalty to your public library, no doubt loyalty to an extraordinary leader, as Barbara said, but also a belief that civic engagement matters, and more on that in a moment. Um, I have great affection for the state of Maine. I now live in Chicago, but um, I pay more taxes in this state than anywhere else because we're in house on Mount Desert Island. Um, and so in the summer, that's where we are, which is um, such a treat. And I think I was, in many ways, I followed Barbara Chase this way. She moved into York, Maine, and we, we uh, got a house in Mount Desert Island while being the 15th head of school at Andover. And I would just say a couple things about Barbara before uh, moving into a lecture, and I will really say two. One is, if you ever have a chance to follow somebody who has done an unbelievable job for 18 years, think twice, because it's a really hard act to follow, and Barbara Chase was exactly that leader and end over. And on the other side, if you have a chance ever to succeed Barbara Landis Chase in something, do it, because she is unbelievably generous and I will say, as a uh, school head, there are many questions and many problems. It is a very challenging job, more challenging than anything else I've worked on. And Barbara had a rule. She told me, I will always be there for you on receive. I will pick up every call. I will show up anytime you want, but I will not tell you what to do. <laughs> and I will say that was the perfect way for somebody to handle succession of something that they loved. And I will say, I called Barbara a lot. Uh, and she always picked up on the first ring. And she was always there. And she gave beautiful advice. And never in seven years did she tell me what to do. So Barbara, thank you for the extraordinary work that you did. And thank you um, for, uh, for inviting me here today. OK, so I am going to give a lecture for sure. But as a school teacher, a high school teacher, there will be a little bit of civic engagement. So, OK, you're ready. Now, I realize for some of you, your heart just sank, but I didn't have to talk to your neighbor. No, I'm not going to make you do that. No <laughs> breakout groups. It's OK. But there will be two opportunities for engagement. One will be near the beginning, and then we'll have Q&A at the end, OK? So that, is that a deal? In between, I will, I, will, uh, I will do the lecture part. But as I was thinking about this inaugural lecture series, and thinking also about the things that we are most invested in at MacArthur Foundation, it got me thinking really deeply about democracy. And one of the things that Barbara and I share is a love of American history, and frankly, a just deep belief that American democracy not only can work, but it must work. It must work for the, for the world. And that it is, to some degree, in peril at the moment. So here's the first interactive part, you ready? How many people are at least a little worried about American democracy these days? <laughs> okay, pretty much 100%. I'm not going to call it anybody else. You might be. And if someone is sanguine about it, that's fantastic, actually. I would love to hear from someone who thinks we're in fine shape. But I'd love to hear a couple of the reasons why you're worried about American democracy. This is still an interactive part. So I need a few volunteers. I have a few answers of my own, but I need a few people to say. Yes. I'm sorry? Oh, please, one. yes. Um, I think what worries me the most is not that people disagree, yeah. but the people don't want to um, listen to each other. Come together so it's a yeah. willingness to listen that worries me the most. Yes, I think some people call this polarization, and others say it's a failure to listen or to, to, to come together. If I heard right from Anne that this was one of the things that Dan was so devoted to, was bringing people together to talk about common issues. and. I think the, the failure of our, of our ability to do that in many communities is definitely definitely high on my list for sure. Other other hands have come. Yes, sir. I would say one of the biggest problems right now is the deterioration of our justice system. Justice, yeah. And on the local level, failure to enforce, failure to prosecute, and failure to do anything about certain types of crimes. And on the national level, where it seems to be very politicized and problematic in the work that we're trying 
Absolutely. the justice system. If it can't be believed in, I think we have very, very serious problems. For sure. So for those who didn't hear, failure of the justice system to do its job in a lot of ways. And, uh, and, and I think there's also a, a mistrust of institutions that it relates to. If we can't actually trust in the courts and the police and the justice system, that our society unravels. So thank you for that one, too. Yes, please. The government has been sold to the highest bidder. Government has been sold to the highest bidder. So money in politics, money in the system, uh, various forms of greed. Probably have lots of ways to go on. Yeah. The speed with which information flows across the internet yes. means that a lie can be propagated much more rapidly than the truth. That's exactly right. So the speed of information flow, but then the fact that lies typically go much more quickly than the truth. So the most recent study of this, I think it was an MIT team that looked at it, they surmised that a lie goes five or six times the speed of the truth. Who knows if it's really true? But that was the very smart people trying to figure it out. And that's a fairly scary idea, right? If you're seeking to propagate a lie, you're gonna have a much better chance of doing that. So those of us who believe in the truth have to work five or six times as hard at least, right? To, to counter that. So absolutely, and I would call that also mis- and disinformation and the ability on the internet to propagate that. Of course, we know that there's been a lot of international effort, like the Russians trying to affect our elections through mis- and disinformation, but certainly around lots of topics within our country too. Other examples, yeah? Uh, I would say, you know, you have the point that the justice system isn't necessarily doing their job in prosecuting certain people and whatnot, but I also think that they do the wrong job in prosecuting a lot of people, and our carceral system is still bloated and goes after people for crimes that I think a lot of young people believe are not, you know, morally wrong, and I think that they distrust the institutions because they're doing things that don't align with, like, reasonable ethics, you know, putting people in jail for what are medical problems, addiction, and, and things like that. So another version of the justice system concern, and maybe from a different angle, the saying we, we incarcerate too many people, in the United States we incarcerate more than anybody else, and we can talk about the, um, the effect of that on, on mistrust and so forth as well. Yeah. I think that I feel like we're losing a lot of freedom in um, national and local journalism, and journalists are either underpaid, disrespected, that the pool of where we can get the truth in what is happening locally and nationally and worldwide, it seems to be shrinking and shrinking. Um, Thank you. So the, the decline in journalism, which is most acute on the local level, I'll talk a little more about this. We've lost more than 2,000 newspapers, probably 2,500 newspapers in the last 20 years. Continues to happen, probably one or two newspapers a week fail absence of the truth or facts that we have to be able to agree on in a democracy. And so with lies spreading quickly and less truth being put out there, particularly covering a school board, say, or the kinds of things in small towns that people need to know about that are no longer supported by journalism, uh, this is part of that erosion. The effort um, that's happening to limit voting mm -hmm. instead of increasing the number of people who can vote. Absolutely. So constraints on voting rights, in essence, across the country, some in some communities more than others, but across the country, one that makes participating in elections harder for some people, and doing that, as you know, uh, yeah, for some people more than others, which is, uh, is exacerbating other tensions. Yeah. Uh, the hollowing out of the middle Okay. in terms of our elected officials and more and more people basically at the extreme, and that, of course, greatly limits the ability to campaign. Thank you. So the hollowing out of the middle was this example, and the uh, inability to compromise. Come across the aisle. We've got an aisle right here, right? Can you reach, reach across and actually uh, come up with a compromise? And, and I think that also affects both the polarization topic. It's going, going further apart, but then also to the extent that, the, let's say, the Congress is unable to come to a conclusion. You've got to you know, shut down the government or whatever. The mistrust in the institutions tends to grow, right? A, a negative spiral. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, loss of the ability to read consensus papers, um, which is not a, a an immediate threat, but it's an extremely deep one that I don't see reversing, and I have no idea how we would change that. Wow. So this is the loss of being able to read contemplatively, to 
read and think, and of course, a space like this inspires you to do that, with people come in here, so it is not necessarily in threat in New York, Maine, thank you to those who make it possible, but for society to have shorter attention spans, for less likelihood to read, say, a long form article if it were presented. Also, my, my understanding from teacher friends that I know who are retiring at this point is that um, it's, it's not just long form, it's reading anything longer than one screen and that they cannot no longer use books like The Great Gatsby because, because even good students won't read them. All right, well, we should come back to The Great Gatsby. I think some, <laughs> some good students will read it, but yeah. maybe not, not all. But The Great Gatsby is a pretty good example. Yes. The problem is we have the violence now in this country. The and increased, the uh, yeah, entire, increased tolerance for violence and being indifferent to it is, is it's even hard to say, isn't it? Yeah, in the very back. Yes. Um, leaning into autocracy. Leaning into autocracy. Oh boy. Yes, that's true. That is true in the US as well as, as elsewhere. Sir. Does the hatred in the political discourse? Hatred within political discourse. Yeah. Okay, one more. Minority rule. Yes. Yeah, so of the few to control the many. Minority rule. Minority rule. Sense sense that the, the democracy itself is actually not, not fully functioning. Okay. We could oh, do you want to? Um, women's rights being totally um, taken away. Women's rights being taken away. Less rights than I did. Extraordinary to think, right? We, we think that the arc of justice and you know the arc of history then to justice and actually on some issues and some periods it does not, right? At least for periods. Um, okay, okay, last one. I just want to throw in there uh, racism. Racism, um, thank which you. Is much more it's seemingly more acceptable now to just be right out there. And certainly in some communities it's better, in some communities it's much worse to be out there with racism. And certainly the racial inequities are, are so acute on health, wealth, and so forth. Um, I suspect we could keep going more or less all afternoon and we'd get more and more depressed. And I wanted to at least surface a bunch of these things. But, and I am certain that in some of these responses, maybe the criminal justice one, that there might be some honest disagreements, there might be a couple other bits of disagreement, and that's good, actually really good. We have to be able, plainly, to say things, and someone might agree or disagree with the racism statement and so forth, or the women's rights statement. But being able to do that in public, without somebody punching somebody else, without arresting somebody else, that is such an unbelievable privilege, right? That we can do that, and in fact, we do do that. You spend your spare time coming out on a Saturday, on a beautiful day, in the afternoon in Maine to do it. It is such a powerful and important thing. I will add a few that didn't come up, and I wasn't sure if all of them would come up. I will go for the full depression a little bit further. <laughs> so I would say on the civic engagement front, what we are doing here in this uh, spot on this beautiful day is not what's happening in every community in America. So I was in the, uh, recently in an a, a, um, academic setting with um, the former prime minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern. Do you know who she is? Wonderful, interesting person. She's spending a year at Harvard as a visiting scholar. If you have a chance to hear her speak, she's really extremely effective. And she wanted time to think. So she decided to come to Harvard for a year to read deeply and to think. She spent five years as head of the nation. Do you know what the turnout in the elections in New Zealand are to elect a president? National election turnout percentage. It was well over 80%. I wish it was 90%. Eight, well over 80%. Okay, so flip to municipal elections in America, even in a good city with a fair amount of turnout. Do you know what sort of a good turnout might be in a good city? 30. Yeah, 30 years. So Boston's a little more than 30. The lowest city turnouts. Does anybody know what the lowest city turnouts are and where they are in America? 10%. 10 is less than 10%. So 5 to 6% in a number of big cities in Texas. So Dallas Fort Worth, as an example, 5 to 6% turnout for a municipal election. Think about it. the ability I mean, uh, that a few people with a fair amount of power, I mean, it really is an extraordinary thing. All the people through American history who have worked and fought to be able to do it, yes? I'm sorry, I just have to point out that, yeah. that Dallas actively works to keep people from voting. So. Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm getting to the, okay. the, the loop. There, there are reasons. I just really couldn't keep that there in. There are reasons why this happened. And there are, and people don't necessarily accept all of the opportunities that we have across the country. Right? We do not, I think, honor the, the, the truth and the history that we have. That that 
is important to, uh, to exercise. So um, voter turnout, I think, is one, whether actively suppressed or people not taking full advantage of, uh, of, of their rights. Um, another one that I would put on the table that I think was not mentioned here so much are some of the new technologies that are coming very quickly. Mm -hmm. I was interested to hear if artificial intelligence yeah. would be one of the things uh, worried about. I have studied it for a few decades, and it is on my list of worries. Uh, as part of this same topic. Why? Because the way that the system works in terms of uh, suggesting things is actually to, in some cases, suppress the uh, likelihood that somebody would participate or to polarize, to pull us apart. Um, so I do think that there are technical things that are happening in the background that make it necessary for us to fight back and to, to come together. So I could go on with other examples, but I think you've given us a great form of, uh, of concern. But what I'd love to do, actually, is to spend most of the time talking about some of the things that push back against us. So um, The Great Gatsby came up. This was a particular example. Um, some of you may know that in, let's see, in the last uh, few years, one of the um, themes that has been uh, a concerning, I think, to people who run libraries in particular is the banning of books. And it seems astonishing that uh, it would be so. But The Great Gatsby is among those books that has been banned in the United States of America including Catcher in the Rye. So most of what Toni Morrison has written, Blue Sky and Color Purple and so forth, lots of them to do with gender, sexuality, of course, we heard an example uh, from here even in New York, Maine. Um, but what I'd love to do is to focus on a few examples. I may push back one that is, I think, um, consistent uh, with civic engagement and I hope a sense of hopefulness. So we've talked about how technology can be a big negative in this area, but it also can be a huge positive. So if in a community, and I won't pick out anybody else in Texas or any other particular communities, but if there were a community that decided to ban a book, what might you do as a, as a comeback? It turns out that librarians are very clever and very resourceful. <laughs> and the digital world allows for the following, which is if you have a scanned version of that book, and somebody is in one of the communities, where the Great Gatsby or the Blue Sky or whatever the book might be has been banned, it is entirely possible for the York Public Library here to offer it up for those people. And that's exactly what's happened. So Barbara mentioned earlier the Digital Public Library of America, something that we started a few years ago. You can all open up, please don't, but you can open up your phones or computers right now and go to dp.la. And the idea is that in an environment like this, a community like this one could step up and make available its materials through the internet to anybody, wherever they might be. So if there's a young person who can't get access to the sexual education book that has been made in another community, they can access it through this activity. Um, the, the example I put up here on the, on the screen is that uh, President Obama actually uh, tweeted this out. So it got a lot of attention. Um, the White House has been very supportive and so forth. But you can now go online and find anything that's been banned in one part of the country um, and is this the First Amendment is made available um, through the technology, something that I think uh, is a great uh, pushback. Second uh, example that I wanted to put on the table is a main example. Uh, there was a, a few minutes ago the suggestion that our democracy is being hollowed out through the use of the uh, uh, mis and disinformation on the internet which is often something that comes about as soon as local news has gone away. So we've lost thousands of newspapers in America, and those newspapers that remain are actually turning out to be very hard businesses to run. So I don't know if there's anybody here who's involved in the local news business, but at one time it supported great fortunes. The Knight Foundation, Annenberg, all, these, these were huge, huge foundations, billions of dollars made through local news. It is now almost impossible to run a local newspaper as a for-profit, and as you may know, that is causing enormous, enormous gaps across the country. One of the biggest examples of that has actually been in Maine, where a group of uh, newspapers came up for sale recently, including the Portland Press Herald and 21 others. Is anybody, was anybody here involved in this particular transaction? Is this entirely possible for a reason I'll say in a minute? Um, and the person who had the, the, the control and the ability had the opportunity to sell to a for-profit uh, outfit. Um, and it turns out that in, in the, uh, the example of greed that came up earlier, uh, one of the challenges is that newspapers that do exist are being purchased one after another, particularly by, there's one hedge fund, I won't name it, but if you want me, I'll tell you about it later. Um, and they've decided that the following business model is a good one. You buy up all the newspapers, 
and for a few years, you put a lot of debt on them, and then you fire all the reporters down to as few as you possibly could have. You get a wire copy or whatever else from the AP to run the newspaper, and you jack up the price, and it turns out that works for a while. It works for a few years. It turns them profitable for a few years. Why? Because people in this room still subscribe to the newspaper, and we're not price sensitive. We don't notice necessarily when it goes from five, nine, nine months to ten, nine, whatever it is. And for a bit, they are getting away with it. I am not exaggerating. You can tell me I'm exaggerating. I am not exaggerating. This is the business model. And across the country, one after another is being purchased in this way. Or if it's not purchased in this way, it's failing. So we have a huge decline. And the options for somebody running a newspaper or uh, able to uh, to, to continue one um, is either to sell to one of these companies, make a little bit of money, um, but know that it will be out of business in three or four or five years. So in Maine, something different happens. A change occurred, an amazing shift occurred, which was the person who had the decision to make decided to sell it to a nonprofit. There is a national nonprofit called the National Trust for Local News, and they stepped up and said, we will help people to buy it. But what they needed was Mainers who were willing to help buy it and to promise to sustain it. And I was on a Zoom call a few months ago, and we put some money in, another group put some money in at the national level, but it was multiple Zoom calls of people in Maine who said, we will put our money up to take the Portland Press Herald and 21 other newspapers across the state into a trust for nonprofit, and we are going to run these as nonprofits. It was a huge change. This was a huge story, and a very important one right here in Maine. It really is a very important example of civil innovation. And when I accepted the speech, I didn't know this was going to be done, but thankfully, um, uh, to, to, um, uh, to uh, with the blessing of the timing, it, it had turned out, in fact, to be, to be the case. Um, I'll give another example uh, in Chicago. So running a newspaper in a small town is very hard, but it turns out that running a city newspaper is equally hard. So at MacArthur Foundation, we have been supporting for decades journalism and media. Barbara mentioned just, verdant, and peaceful. Say what? Does anybody know why you've heard those lines before? Yeah. NPR, NPR. <laughs> so that's what we've been doing. We, we give out the genius grants. I'm happy to talk about those later. And we've been supporting NPR, BBS, and we continue to do that. In this country, we don't support public media enough, and so foundations do it. And that's why Just, Bird, and Peaceful is, uh, it's actually very good advertising. We don't do it for that reason, but it, it works. Um, but in Chicago, in our hometown, our newspapers were failing. And there are two. One was called the Chicago Tribune, and the other is the Chicago Sun-Times. We're down to two big newspapers. And a couple years ago, the Chicago Tribune came up for sale. The other bidder was this hedge fund that I mentioned, and they were bidding up the price to the hundreds of millions of dollars. And my phone, as President MacArthur Foundation man, off the hook. You do journalism. We can't not have the Tribune. You have to buy it. What Tribune? Like, we're a foundation. We're going to buy a newspaper. Where am I, where am I know about running a newspaper? It'll fail on my watch. Um, so, you know, what are you supposed to do? Anyway, we waded into it. We said, could we buy the Tribune? It would have been hundreds of millions of dollars to buy it. And it would have been hundreds of millions of dollars to make it actually work. And we had a lot of money, but it just seemed like that was not a good bet. So we passed, and this hedge fund bought it, and they are doing just what you would expect. They are firing the reporters, they're running AP copy, they're jacking up the price. It will be gone. The Chicago Tribune will be out of business in three, four, five years. No question about it, or it will be a shell of, its, of itself. Its net promoter score, which is one of those things that you look at in businesses, whether somebody thinks it's positive, is now negative. So anybody asked about the Tribune who actually subscribes to it, tells people not to subscribe to it, so it's going down the tubes. At the same time, somebody else had another newspaper called the Sun-Times, that's the number two newspaper in Chicago, and they called up and they said, look, it's losing $5 million a year, and not only do you not have to pay $300 million for it, we'll give it to you for $1, and we'll give you some money to boot because these people are having to put up money year after year. So what happened was that the public media uh, company, which runs the, the NPR station, WBEZ, uh, decided that they would acquire this newspaper, the Sun-Times. Take that for-profit newspaper, turn it into a non-profit, and make one company. And this became actually a very interesting idea. So we talked about racism a moment ago. One of the things that Chicago is, is incredibly segregated. There is a, there's worse segregation in, in uh, Chicago than anywhere else. And the media companies really serve some communities and not others really well. 
So it turns out that Chicago Public Media, WBEZ, serves the north side of the city and is almost all white and Asian and more or less wealthy um, constituents. And the Sun Times, it turns out, calls itself the hardest working newspaper in America. It tends to serve the black and brown communities in Chicago. And they had very different audiences. So when these two companies came together, it was the first time that there actually was a company, not a profit, but a company, that was serving all three million of the people in Chicago and seeking to reach all of these different uh, constituents. So along with others, we put a whole bunch of money into it. There's now a nonprofit, which is a combined non-public radio station plus a newspaper. And here's the experiment. With a bunch of money from philanthropy, which is to say $60 million, so not a small amount of money, to invest in a more diverse group of reporters serving the entire city of Chicago for the first time, and to drop the paywall so that when you go online, you can actually access the information for free, it then requires something to happen. What was going to have to happen once you've done all this? Sorry? More subscribers? Somebody's got to pay. Somebody's got to pay, right? And the answer probably is to see it as a membership model. Much like the National Public Radio System, which is actually working, the WBC model is working. It's a solvent enterprise because people are members and they contribute to it. What's happened is fewer and fewer and fewer people are subscribing to the newspapers. The advertising budget has all gone over to Google and to Facebook, right, at a national level. So they've lost their advertising, they've lost their subscriber base. The thing that actually is working is a membership model like PBS or NPR. So the question is, can this actually work? Is it possible to, by providing a really valuable, really interesting set of information that people need to survive in their community, civic engagement, civic involvement, will people step up and say, just like arts and culture, just like a library, just like a school, we actually have to pay for the news and information that is core to living in a democracy. And we're gonna find out whether people are willing to pay. But this is an example of whether or not that possibly can work with a lot of seed money from philanthropy, obviously, um, and really well-meaning people and a really big devotion to bringing a community together, regardless of uh, where you come from and so forth. So we're going to see a very big net placed on this particular idea, and we will find out. It may be a total fail, but we're going to find out. A side note to this particular story. The side note is I sat recently with a group of graduate students in journalism. Graduate students, so mid twenties, and they're incredibly smart, incredibly devoted to work in journalism, and they go to a school called Medill, which is a Northwestern University, which is among the very top journalism schools in the country. And one of the challenges that they were talking about, you may know this, journalism school is pretty much the worst deal out there in grad school. So you come out with debt that's about six figures in debt, hundred thousand dollars in debt. And if you're trying to get one of the declining number of jobs in the field, we've lost you know, literally tens of thousands of journalists. If you actually get the job, you're probably making 35,000, maybe 40,000, and you've got all this debt. So I'm talking to these students about this problem. And of course, here we are uh, putting some serious money into these organizations to try to, to pay for it. Um, and I said, okay, so I get it, that's bad. Uh, let me ask you about your habits in terms of you know, reading news and so forth. I said, how many of you subscribe to your newspaper? Of this group of graduate students, zero people subscribe to the newspaper. How many people here subscribe to the newspaper and pay? Virtually all. Okay, so this group of graduate students were not actually paying for the newspaper. So how many Hulu, Netflix, whatever? 100%. <laughs> and then I had that moment that you have when you're a teacher or you're an older person. <laughs> you point it out? I'm not going to point it out. Yeah. How long can I wait until somebody points it out? Anyway, it then like light bulb, light bulb, light bulb, light bulb, light bulb, went around the room. It's like, if nobody is paying for the news, you, journalists, not only do you not have a job, you do not have a salary. Like somebody, you want to go into the city, somebody has to pay. And right now it is older people. It's older people who have gotten used to paying, who continue to pay out of the goodness of one's heart. But it is not, you know, it's not necessarily spread across generations and even among journalism students. So there's a big change that will have to happen, which is in this internet era, we're gonna to have to figure out how are we gonna pay for it? What is the way in which we're going to get more people to contribute somehow to this effort? Some of it's gonna be philanthropy, some of it's gonna be being a member, as you would be for your NPR station. You may be asked to do that for your newspaper, as, as we were asking uh, in Chicago. But figuring out a sustainable model for this is essential. 
And one of the reasons that this, to my mind, is so essential is the point before about communities uh, breaking apart and not having the uh, news and information that they need. Now more than 20% of America does not have a local news provider. And most of those are in places like the rural south. They're often in red states. They're often in places that don't have a ton of other information coming in. And what happens in those environments is the lie spreads, the misinformation, the disinformation comes in. So we have a problem with which are called news deserts across the country. And those news deserts are growing with every passing year as we lose one or two newspapers every single week. So the question is, can we do something about it? Barbara has um, uh, given the, the, uh, um, the preview of what we're trying to do as one example, and we'd love your help. Uh, the effort is called Press Forward, and in traveling around the country trying to figure out how we might address this issue, I found that there actually were a lot of people who had the concerns that you all have shared, but also really wanted to help figure out, could we actually jumpstart a better, stronger democracy, one community after another, through local news? And one of the reasons why this is, and we can talk more about this in the Q&A, one of the reasons this is so is it turns out that when we try to deal with things on a local level, we actually have less polarization. So at the national level, the incentive is pulling people apart, but it tends to be local news when you're coming in a community covers sports. It covers the team that's going to America's Got Talent. Like, no matter what it is, people come together more likely in small towns, and you can deal with the difference, different views on social justice or different views on, views on the, the, the justice system. But if we actually try to come together around local news, I think it is one of the things that could strengthen democracy. And I realized that MacArthur Foundation, with lots of money and lots of ability to you know, support things like in our city of Chicago, if we did it alone, it would not be enough. So I took off my fund giving hat for a moment, and I put on my fund raising hat, which Barbara and I share. She gave me the fund raising hat. That's what you do as a school head. You're asking for money all the time. And I went to fellow foundation presidents of the Ford Foundation. I went to the Knight Foundation. I went to the Hewlett Foundation. I went to Carnegie and said, come with us. Put money in together. And maybe we can make a splash by saying, if we put a lot of money together, we might be able to jumpstart this thing. We might be able to come up with models that are going to work in this new era. The current model is not working, and it's not going to be able to be supported philanthropically forever. But I bet if we do a whistle stop tour across this country, that people are going to raise their hands and say, we're worried about democracy. We know there has to be local news. And we'll figure out a way to pay for it in some way, at, at, despite the challenges. So this particular um, announcement came out on Thursday, which we've timed in advance of this very talk. So I can talk about it, but it was very secret up until then, no big secret. But on Thursday, we announced half a billion dollars across 22 foundations, 22 funders, to try to address this issue. And so the idea is, in the next five years, we're going to fund a whole bunch of different things. We're going to get lots of other people to help. It is not going to solve the problem. It's not going to save democracy. But it is going to really, really, really try to put a down payment on things that actually can bring us together, independent of ideology, focused on democracy across the country in ways that I think might make a difference. So here are the four things that we are going to invest in with this half a billion dollars, which I hope will grow. One is strengthen local newsrooms that have the trust of local communities. So I think in many of the comments that you all gave earlier, at the core of that is trust. It has to be trust in institutions. We have to believe that the institutions have you know, the, the, the truth in mind and, and, and are worthy of our trust. And I think one of the things we've seen, particularly among young people, is that the trust in institutions has fallen dramatically. And I think that has to be rebuilt. I think there's more trust for those of us who are older, but it still has eroded uh, as well. And the news media has had its trust numbers fall terribly, particularly during polarization. Do you know what one of consistently, if not the highest, trusted institution in America is? Five. Five race. Unbelievably, across the board, the, the public library is the most trusted institution in almost every survey I've seen. So libraries have, have continued to do this, I think, by doing what you're doing here, which is to bring people together without a partisan agenda, but really around the good of the community. So can we invest directly in examples of organizations and people and groups that come together and show what it means to have trusted local news provision in the community? Number two, accelerate the enabling environment for news production and dissemination. This one is jargony, I realize that doesn't mean all that much um, to those who are not philanthropy. But what this means is across the country, we don't need to reinvent the wheel in every one of the towns. 
We do not have to do it in every one of the cities. We can come up with models and systems that can be shared. So if what's happening is people are more likely to get their news on an iPhone app, let's create one good iPhone app, not 10,000, right? So I think at a national scale, we can figure out some things that are gonna work and share those much more broadly. Third, close long-standing inequities in journalism coverage and practice. It turns out that the news media business, like venture capital and some others, are have very few, very few people of color who are involved. And many of the reasons that there's mistrust in the uh, in the journalism system is that it has been not uh, not diverse as the communities are. So one of the things we're going to invest in is ensuring that across the board that there's gender equity and racial equity and so forth in the journalism core across the country. And it turns out that in journalism school, there's you know the, the next generation is much more diverse, but it's actually one of the key uh, key things that we will fund. And then last, policies that expand public access to local news and civic information. So this one might be the one that's controversial here, but let me try it for a second. I think that actually the government has to be involved. You might say, we do not want the government involved in news, and there are good reasons why not. But I actually think we have to think about policies that ensure that there's enough money for local news. So there are a bunch of ways to do it. Of course, could be you know, tax and subsidy. I'm not as interested in that. In Australia and in Canada, there are proposals, there are actually laws that require the tech companies to pay for some of the news. It turns out the technology companies have gotten very big by sharing the news that other people produce and then running ads against them. And so having some sharing of that revenue back to local news providers would ensure that actually the coverage can happen. So if there's young journalists in the know, they actually can get paid, whereas the tech companies are right now siphoning that off. That could work. But another example is a really simple one that we got done in Chicago which is, it turns out that the government, the municipal government, spends a fair amount of money on advertising, and it has to put certain things, print certain things, and so forth, and they're spending a lot of that money off to tech companies. It actually is now the law in Chicago that half of the municipal spend in the city has to go to local news providers. Seems simple, but the money that the government, is, our money, our tax dollars, is actually going now to help produce the news and to cover what that city council is doing. So I think there are a number of things that we could do uh, together uh, through public policy. I'm very open to your critique that that's not a good idea because I realize you, know, you don't want the government necessarily involved so much in the news. On the other hand, if we don't actually change the enabling environment, I think we're gonna have a problem. Okay, so let me say one last thing and then I'll open up for the next engagement because I'm sure some of what I've said will be disagreeable and we need to have a uh, good, uh, good public discussion about it and love to hear your thoughts. But I actually think, in addition to this large-scale effort to get half a billion dollars and all these things, I think the most important thing is actually what you've done today, which is not to spend time every day in the sunshine or on a boat or whatever, but actually to come back into a public library to have an open and honest discussion about the state of our democracy and figure out what we're going to do about it. And I think that is the absolute most hopeful thing that we possibly could do. So um, in the memory of Dan and his board, um, with great, great thanks to all of you, um, I think this is actually the answer. It's actually coming together to try to figure out how to solve the hardest problems that we have. And I totally believe that if we do that, American democracy is going to thrive. Thank you so much. Love to have some questions or comments or pushback, and I can see I can see it coming. So that's good. All day. Uh, can you recommend some honorable fact-checking sites? I'm going. I'm very unhappy with my kids. Very worried about my kids because they're coming home with the stuff they're getting off of TikTok and all these different sites. It's just absurd. And I'm trying to guide them towards some fact-checking sites that can double-check what's being put out there. Can you suggest that? Well, I would say um, we've invested in a whole bunch of them, and later on I'll, I'm happy to send you some of the things that we've, we've given grants to. Great. But I, the, the difficulty, I would say, with the fact-checking approach is that not everything can be immediately fact-checked, and so there's not just one. So I, I will gladly send you some of the, the ones that, that we, we've done, and, and the, um, the Knight Foundation has also funded a, a bunch of them as well. Um, but. Uh, I think the answer is actually more interactive than that. I think the answer is actually that it's more the practice of figuring out when you're presented with something, how do you engage critically with the information and go online and do the work? And I think that might be something that is best done actually together, right? So if there's a way to you know, make that 
an activity to do together rather than just having one, you know, sending somebody to one site. That unfortunately is probably the right investment. Together with no children? Yes, yes. Yes, I understand. <laughs> All right. Yeah, but try, I don't know. What about being on what about being on FaceTime and doing it together? Yeah. I hadn't thought of that. Uh, I don't know. I, all of, uh, so I will give you some pointers on specific ones, but I think it, it I think it has to be interactive. All right, we'll yeah. give it a try. <laughs> so could you address what happened in Kansas? Um, are you talking about the police raid on the police, raid, police raid, yeah. So uh, the example, and I, this was on the longer list of the, the, the problems, of course, was um, you know in some towns where the uh, where the, the city government has been criticized by the newspapers, um, they've decided that the right answer is to send the police in to raid the newspaper, um, and in fact, the home of some of the people who were running the newspaper, including a home with somebody who was ninety plus years old who in the days that followed it passed away, um, and you can't be, I'm being recorded here, make a causal assumption, but it was a pretty tragic set of events. Where is it? Uh, in, it was in Kansas, um, uh, and so we may remember the exact name of the town, but um, it, it has been widely covered, and the, the, uh, in the quick aftermath, they realized that they had overreached in their uh, use of police power, and they pulled back on the search but I think it's a it's a great example where uh, you know a, a, a city did not did not believe in, in the ability of a local news to say the truth and decided to use the power of the state against it. My um, last half full version of that is that the community stood up and said, "We don't have this. You know, you, you can't you can't use the police power to read a newspaper because they said something critical of you and stood up for the First Amendment." So there's a terrible story, and then I actually think. This is story also of the system working. Do you disagree or? No, I agree. I, the follow up was in fact that the town came to the to the defense of the of the editor in the paper. Exactly. Yeah. So that the town believed enough in what yeah. was happening and, and the truth. Yeah. So how do we balance First Amendment freedoms with the harm caused by mis and disinformation? The Fifth Circuit yesterday upheld the preliminary injunction uh, stopping the Biden administration and substantially upholding the injunction from preventing disinformation about COVID uh, that was being disseminated to the public. And on the one hand, First Amendment says you should have the right to free speech. On the other hand, you're seeing incredible harm, harm to public health caused by misinformation and disinformation. And it just seems to be getting worse with the lies that are transmitted. How do we balance those two? So it's a, it's a similar question in a way to, to this, this other one, because I think at the core of it is the First Amendment. The ability to, uh, on the one hand, to say anything that is, uh, you know, hopefully truthful, and um, and uh, on the other hand, when the state gets involved and tries to push back on that, then it results in a court case, as in both of these instances, with different outcomes. So, for those who haven't followed this, uh, a very high-level court, but not the Supreme Court, decided that the Biden administration had gone too far in trying to correct the misinformation that was uh, flowing quickly through the tech platforms. So at the moment, the outcome is the government cannot do that kind of correction of that information. I suspect this will go to the Supreme Court, so I don't think we're done with this particular case. Um, I would think if you were in the administration right now, you're probably thinking, okay, so how can we accomplish some similar goals to ensure the information is accurate without tripping up on the First Amendment? You know, that, to my mind, is exactly what First Amendment lawyers are always you know, trying to, to find, that, find that particular line. My guess, given the strength of our First Amendment, is that in general, the government is not going to be able to do this work. And so partly when I was reacting to the, the fact checking and so forth, I think it's going to have to be much more local than that. Family by family, individual by individual, teacher to students in communities. Because I don't think, with the way the First Amendment is structured, that it's going to be very easy for the government to do that on a consistent basis. So that, I think we may have to look to other solutions. That, that's my hunch after this opinion. It's, it's tough when Florida and other states are making rules prohibiting the dissemination of accurate information to students. Yeah, so the, there's a the related topic that I think is most most extreme in some ways is the statement by a actual state in this case, Florida, that you can't teach certain things, to my mind, strikes me as absolutely violating the First Amendment right of the teacher 
and also the First Amendment right of the student to hear. So this one is baffling to me that, in fact, these are persisting. But they're true in, in dozens of states at the moment. And it, is, it turns out that the jurisprudence is extremely complicated in terms of the, uh, of, uh, the ability to restrict what's done in schools. And the First Amendment on the teacher side is actually not that strong, ultimately, which is why, why this has so far been successful. So um, I'm not actually that sanguine that these are going to get pushed back. And so when I gave the example of the DPLA and the, um, uh, and the, the national effort against censorship, it may be technical workarounds like that that are necessary if, in fact, a state can uphold that consistent with the First Amendment. It doesn't sound right to me as a First Amendment person, but it is how many of the courts have interpreted it, which is so complicated. How about way back? Yeah, so um, some, some people may not have been able to hear totally, so I'll restate at least in, in part the question. Um, so if I understood it correctly, it was to say it's one thing in the city of Chicago where you have a, it is a left of center government interested in civic information and so forth, being willing to, to be supportive. How, if you are in a different political setting where a government may be less inclined to be helpful, can you effectively ensure local news provision through, through a newspaper? Um, I want to say, while it is true that young people are less likely to uh, pay for subscriptions, I don't want to demonize young people. That is never my, my game plan. I think we have to work on the demand side of the equation, if you will, and ensure that young people are a part of the solution. But part of it is young people feel like we've all failed them, right? And there are lots of reasons why this, is, why this is the case. So I do want to make sure I'm not conveying the demonization message. It's, it's, it's more complicated than that. Um, and yes, young people do have to step up and pay, and that, that will not be necessary, but, but there's a, a meeting of them part right. Um, so let me say, it is definitely easier to, uh, to support a local newspaper right now in a city that has, or a place that has, people willing to say, we don't want this to fail, and we're going to put out money, and the city's going to help, and so we're right. absolutely right. So um, one of the reasons that we're doing this as a national effort with half a billion dollars, and hopefully more over time, is that we realize that sometimes it's going to have to get subsidized from other places, right? So that is partly why using a national approach is uh, you know, is going to be crucial. But that's not going to be enough. I, I think about where I my home city, the home state is Massachusetts. There are 351 cities and towns. How many cities and towns in Maine? I'm not sure. Does anyone know? 250. 250. 257, awesome. Okay. So 257 in, in Maine, 351 messages. No matter how much money I can raise, we can't do it. That's not, not going to work. So it has to have you know, local roots in, you know, ultimately. Um, and you know, I think the, the, the nudge I would give for Concord, New Hampshire, otherwise, of course, I would hope that the city and state would help to, to some degree. But, but I don't think it's, you, you don't ever want to get to the place where the government is the main source of money, right? Because it comes back to the Kansas problem, right? If the, if the government is the main source of funding, then they just cut it off if they are criticized, right? Or they raid it and they you know, put people in the hospital. So that's not, a, I think public policy can help and some public money can help, but it's going to have to be us. It's going to have to be us, one way or the other, right? Whether we are doing it through subscriptions or calling in memberships or paying to come to events, or philanthropically giving money, somehow, this is what I'm jumping up and saying, it's like, we're gonna have to pay. And some people are not paying, right? And so um, I think the, the, the best I can offer in that setting is to say, um, 
at least when I uh, talk to my friends who are, uh, I'm, I will admit I'm left of center, but my friends who are right of center and who, for instance, supported George H.W. Bush, one of the things that he talked about was a thousand points of light, right? We're gonna have a smaller government, and the way we're gonna meet those social needs is we're gonna step up individually and be those thousand points of light. What I say to my friends on the right is, now's the time to show up. Show up. We're not, we're plainly not doing it, right? Now is the time to take out your checkbook and write a check. And that check could, by the way, go to this library for this lecture series. And I will join you all in doing that. We should all do it. So here's my fundraising moment, right? We should do that together. But, it, but we're gonna have to write checks for things that we're not used to, which might be a newspaper. Right? And, and I think that's the that's kind of a mindset shift that's going to have to happen in these next few years. We're going to have to see newspapers, strangely, not as a business we pay for a subscription, but as a charity we're going to support as we do a uh, great Irish school or, or something else that is a public good. Let's just follow up on this with oh. You know, we do this with NPR. Yeah. Yes, let me, let me say a couple things. So if you're saying, Glenn, that we should do this, I'm raising my hand and putting half a billion dollars on people to do it, okay? Like, I, I don't think Glenn's speech should step up more, right? And I do hope we'll get to a billion. Like, so that's happening. That's happening today with real dollars, cash, and the matter, okay? But I am not so sure that I want billionaires owning everyone in the newspapers. That, to my mind, is the concern about, somebody mentioned earlier, too, too few people control that, you know, I will say the Boston Globe has turned into, that's my hometown originally, has turned into a better newspaper under the Henrys. They've actually done a very good job. They have invested in it. They've had extremely good leadership. It actually has become a better newspaper. It's covered more communities. It's done a more diverse way. It actually, so there are salutary examples where sometimes billionaires will buy it. Mrs. Henry, Linda Henry, I believe, has been the driving force. I think she's done a really good job. Has just be Bezos done a good job at the Washington Post? You know, say yes or no. The Salzburgers have done a fabulous job with the New York Times. It actually is now a profitable company, um, but it is the end of one. I think there's really one actual newspaper in our country that actually is a profitable entity, which is the New York Times. Yeah. And it's because they got to such a large number of digital subscribers, which is much cheaper for them to run, and they managed it very, very well. Disagree or disagree that the New York Times is a good newspaper. It actually is a good and profitable business by virtue of what they've done. But other than I mean, we talk about the Wall Street Journal or business, but anything that's sort of a general purpose newspaper, none of the rest of them are making any money. So I think the question that, and, and you're putting it very well in the form of this question is, would you want every town to have a billionaire, whatever it is, owning a newspaper and running however they want to do it in a democracy? Or would you want some other model where a lot of us are supporting it as a public good? And we're gonna have to choose between one of those things. The, the model that worked 50 years ago and was the kindly group of people in the town who ran a friendly little local news, it's gone. It doesn't exist, it's, it's, it's tough. So we have to figure out what the other thing is. And I'm not positive that the answer is just turning over to Axios, which is doing very well at national, right? Or any of the ones that are doing it at a different, at a different level. I think it has to be local. And I think it has to be variable in, in various different communities. And we're gonna have to step up and, you know, and, and pay for it somehow. So it's a great, great point. Um, but I'm, I'm quite worried about the billionaire on the model. Is that David Chase in the back? If you will permit me. Always. Oh, great. I have a question for the audience. Yes, please. Is there anyone here working for a newspaper or any form of media who is covering this event? Ooh, what a nice question. No. Now, five years ago, Deborah McDermott, who was the reporter for the York Weekly, would have been here. Now the York Weekly doesn't have a local reporter, doesn't have an editor. For 
New York Weekly. New York Weekly belongs to Seacoast Media, which belongs to Gannett. Gannett. Mr. Palfrey, how is Gannett doing? <laughs> well, what, what, a good, what a good question. So um, there are a few national uh, entities. Uh, Gannett is one, McClatchy is another. I've mentioned that hedge fund that I probably won't name because I'm really mad at them. Um, <laughs> uh, not a bunch of newspapers. Um, and I think none of them, you know, the ones that are the traditional newspaper chains are not doing well. Um, McClatchy, as you may know, was in bankruptcy you know, two years ago. Um, I don't think Gannett is exactly thriving as, a, as an entity. Um, so when I say running newspapers, unless you are just grinding them down to a husk, are not good businesses, and there's just the extractive version that, that, that can be done. So nobody's making money doing it, and that, that is at the core of the problem. We, in this capitalist system, there's got to be some sustainable model. Um, I think back to my time in, in the town of Andover, Barbara, and I'd be curious your reaction uh, to this. When I first started, the Andover Townsman was actually a, a, a quite good weekly. Andover is a town of 35,000, something like that, or four. Um, and it was actually quite a good newspaper. It had an editor who was downtown, and they had a little shop, and they had a bunch of reporters, and they ran around. They actually gave us sort of a hard time. The school we ran was the biggest employer in town, and you know, um, if we didn't give enough, you know, whatever we didn't do, we would get covered. And actually, it was kind of good. You know, it was it was it could be irritating, but it was it was done well. And so I started in 2012, and I got to know the editor, and I got to know the various people, and I'd go down and chat with them whatever. In 2019, when I left, they did a story. You know the head of school is leaving to become head of the McCarthy Foundation, and um, uh, the townsman, not surprisingly, called up, and the woman uh, came to see me, and it was somebody who just graduated from college, and had never met her before, and you know, she had not been, she had no, no context with school or me or anything else, and she was covering my seven years there, um, and I just asked her, you know, so how's it going at the, the newspaper, and she said, well, I'm it, I'm it. And so somebody who literally just came out of school, there was it. So, and this is in a very well off, you know, town and, and all the rest. So, the, 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 the problem is the, mo the model is broken. The model is broken really everywhere. The, the very few examples of the New York Times and Washington, the Washington Journal, those are not local news providers. That's not what they're doing. They're doing something else. And of course, by the way, TV news continues to do okay, but um, that's mostly uh, national and so forth. So, the, your point, David Chase, is really well taken. In the community, there are not people who are doing this work, um, you know, community by community. And look, this was not newsworthy. That I'm not saying anything useful. That's fine. But if you go to the town council meeting, or you go to the school board, or you go to the places, you know, or a town meeting in, in the New England style, like there has to be somebody covering that, right? That is, in fact, without that accountability, there will be corruption. There will be there will be terrible things happening. And I so so I think this is this is a pretty urgent thing. I think for American democracy. And I see tons of hands. I just want to, oh, no, I just recognize that it's kind of well after the hour. So I just want to make sure that those, are we okay for a couple more? Yeah. Those who, those who are running the show. <laughs> That's how are you saying that any local communities step up and buy the paper back from, from Gannett? That's such, a good, that's such a good question. I haven't seen that particular movie. The best story is Maine. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm not making this yeah, up because yeah. I'm here. But this idea of, What's good about it is, you know, the, the hardship occurs. The person running it doesn't take the highest bid. I'm sure that they could have gotten more money from this hedge fund, um, which is just doing the scoop up thing. But they decided, in the public good, to do it through a nonprofit, and that you know that it wouldn't have been possible, but but for the combination of a ton of mayors saying that they want to make sure that so it happens. So I think it's the best example. I believe that. As McClatchy has effectively failed on bankrupt, they can have will do it. So, so one of the reasons we're doing this now is that I think that I think there's just going to be failure after failure after failure, and communities are going to have to right. And and whether it's one person, one family, I don't know. It's I think going to have to be that's going to have to be the model on some level, and people are going to have to say, okay, how how are we going to you know replace the the York Weekly effectively, um, or you know augment it for a while and then and then compete with it. Um, Baltimore Banner would be an interesting example. So, um, for those who have followed this story, um, when the Chicago Tribune was up for sale, so too was the Baltimore Sun. And so, the group we were talking with involved a guy named Stuart Bam, who was on 60 Minutes about this recently. I don't know if you've seen it, but you could Google it. 
Um, anyway, he wanted to buy the Sun when we wanted to buy the Tribune, and he couldn't get the Sun, the, this hedge fund won. But he said, I'm going to start an alternative. So he personally has funded this thing called the Baltimore Banner, which is the, um, and he's, he's not one of those billionaires. He's trying to get other people to pay for it too. Um, but, but I think what you'll see is um, more and more uh, startups uh, of this sort. And there are about 200 of these kinds of startups. So that's probably a better example. It's less about buying the legacy one and saying, we're going to try something new. New Bedford Light is an example in Massachusetts. If you know New Bedford, you can check that one out. So these are digital only typically. Um, they're now printing a paper, um, and it's people coming together and doing it through, uh, through uh, contributions. Um, I need some help here. Um, who's, uh, can I, uh, just I don't want to um, take too many, and I see a lot of hands, so can I, can I have help with just calling on a few people? Uh, sure. Or not. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Why do we start here? Can I switch gears real quickly? Yeah. You said you're going to mention some things about the Genius Grants. Oh yeah. Can you talk about some you know numbers and dollars and uh, things like that for us that don't know the whole story of what you do? Oh my gosh, sure. Have fun. Have fun. Um, not the topic of the lecture, but my, my favorite topic from work um, in some ways. So MacArthur Foundation every fall gives out between twenty and twenty-five typically. Uh, things that are known as the Genius Grant, it's not what we call it, but you can call it that if you want, to the MacArthur Fellows, um, dollars. Um, so here's what happens. I call up the person and say, guess what? You're receiving a MacArthur Fellowship, it's $800,000. It is unrestricted, you get it over five years. Um, you do not apply for it. You do not report anything. You may use it to buy a house. You may use it to go on sabbatical, or you can pay for your organization, whatever you want to do. Um, and the idea is to support creativity, to support the, um, the, the kind of things that are not getting enough support otherwise. Um, in terms of numbers, we've done about 1,000 of them since uh, the early 1980s. Um, the way it works is, you, while you can't apply, we reach out to um, thousands of nominators every year from different fields. Nominators then give us suggestions, and then we have peer reviewers in their field without them knowing about it, right about them. And then we have a very small group of selectors um, uh, I was one actually when I was head of school in Hanover, it's very secret. Um, and so you don't get stopped in the grocery store and you know, trying to how can you give me a fellowship? Um, uh, but now I can talk about it. Uh, and, um, and that group actually decides on the, on the group. So we will have, I think it's October the 3rd or 4th, something like that, we will announce our fellows. I know who they are, but I will not say them. So I'm being recorded here. Um, but the idea, one of the big ideas is to try to, um, to sort of spark hope. You know, it's people who are doing things that are interesting and creative in a lot of different fields, um, and to, to you know, just suggest how much incredible creativity we have in, in the field. I would say that, that if there's a secret to it, the secret word is enablement. So we try to enable something that otherwise wouldn't happen but for this grant and this money. Mm -hmm. And it's often been some of the ones that are most sort of uh, compelling stories to me, or when you talk to somebody who said, I was working in this field, nobody cared about this field, and when you gave me a grant, I started getting all these other grants. Um, or you talk to a woman who is in a field of science, and no woman is in this field of science getting any attention, and all of a sudden, I had the biggest lab you've ever seen. All of a sudden, the NIH sent me my, so it is, it's an ability, I think, to say this matters in a society, and it's not getting enough attention, and, and so it's that, that knock on effect that's very hopeful. So thank you for the chance to talk about it. Why don't we do two more questions? Okay. And then I'm going to invite everybody to enjoy this wonderful, uh, wonderful food that we have back here. <laughs> okay. I just have a question about measurement and yeah. generally how you think about it in philanthropy, but then also specifically with regards to a revitalization project. Yeah. In terms of what you measure and how, and timing, how you think of it's a big project, yeah. right? And so where do you see your progress moments and so this is such, such a good question, and to read, this is like the ultimate geeky philanthropic question, so you clearly know something about philanthropy. Um, so the, the field in philanthropy is called evaluation and learning, and if you ever work in philanthropy as a program officer or president, you realize along the way that the most fun job is actually to be the evaluator and the learning people, um, and so they all want to kind of die and grow up and you know, end up being the evaluation people. Um, so it's really interesting to ask these questions and to do, to do this work. Um, and typically you have people outside the foundation, so you're not evaluating your own, your own things, so you have partners. So in the case of this, before we went public on Thursday, we hired uh, somebody outside to say, what are the things we're gonna measure to say whether our half a billion dollars was well spent and can we, can we go do more? So here are a few. 
Um, one is this problem of new, new deserts. So if 20% of America right now doesn't have a local news provider, can we either stop the drain because it's going in the wrong direction, and if at all possible, reverse it so we actually have fewer news deserts? To my mind, that's a very important one. So that might be measured literally in humans who have access to local news you know, for themselves. Um, we believe a lot in diversity of who's actually telling the stories. So if it is just as white and just as male at the end of it, we will fail. So how are we ensuring that those who are telling the stories are reflective of and connected to the communities that are um, uh, across America, right? Um, so that's a, a second one. A really big one for me is the sustainability point, as we've been, uh, we've been talking about. If we haven't come up with financially sustainable models, it's not going to work. Right? And it doesn't mean that to be for profit. I'm okay with for profit, by the way. I'm not anti, this is not a capitalist street. It, it is, in fact, the case that some for profits may well succeed. But we, if it's a non profit, it at least has to break even. Otherwise, nobody gets paid back. So sustainability is a big one. So we've come up with a whole bunch of these metrics. The interesting and tricky and dorky thing is when you have 22 different funders, they actually have different um, points of view. So the emphasis is on a different syllable for some you know, uh, different foundations. And trying to do it in America, independent of ideology, where we do have Republicans involved as well as Democrats. You know, we have we have the whole thing going. Um, is we have to be okay with some of the outcomes not being delightful to others, and so that's where this one is actually tricky. But thank you. Wow, that's a, that's such a good question. Um, the gentleman right here in the green. Thank you. I have a public service announcement. Free <laughs> offer. Won't cost you anything. For the first time, uh, the York Adult Education Program will be offering a course called An Introduction to News Literacy. Wow. wow. I've been working on it for two years. <laughs> yeah, all right. It's totally great. But I, John, if, you, if I might, your first slide, the Portland Press Herald. Yes. So in preparation for this class, I'm a retired middle school teacher, curriculum director, but not a journalist. So I decided I need to learn a little bit about what journalists do. I contacted the Portland Press Herald. Steve Greenlee, the executive editor, invited me to interview him. And then he invited me to attend these news editor meetings. So for this old middle school teacher to go up there and sit in on the meetings, on the day that the story broke that they were going to be sold I was in the room. No way. Oh I'm looking around the room like, holy crap! <laughs> Did you offer a bite? You're all like, well, let's see. We're going to place this above here, and that'll move up here, and this story will go first. And, and I'm thinking, this is about you guys. <laughs> anyway, Steve Greenlee will be uh, bringing a team for our, in our, it's a six session course. It starts Wednesday, October 4th. Steve Greenlee, executive editor, will be bringing a team of people from the Portland Press Herald. So, if you want to ask questions, that's the person you want to you want to ask about this whole world of what's happening. Uh, we will be addressing fact checking. We will be addressing all, First Amendment. We will be addressing all of these different topics that we'll talk about tonight. So this is just perfect. Wow, well, so good. <laughs> What's your name? George Whitbread. George, George Whitbread. Okay, so I think George has given us the great conclusion that will lead us right to the right to the reception of George. I really think um, and I, I started out with this idea that this was going to be a lecture but interactive. You have made the point in such a perfect way, which is in democracy it has to be a verb. Right? We actually have to get up and do something and you Stood up and, and did something, and so the I think we're going to have to keep doing that. George, the library you. actually has a program on uh, every Friday at three o'clock called News and Views. It's also offered at Century Hill, and it's an opportunity, open opportunity for people to just talk about things, express different points of view, and trying to put into practice some of the things that you were uh, trying to say might make us a stronger democracy. Awesome. So that's Thank a plug you. for the library, Michelle. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.
the uh, reception that we have to follow. Thank you again. Thank you.